This house belongs to you and to every American. For eight years, just a short chapter in the long story of our democracy, my family also had the privilege of calling the White House home. The architect who designed the White House was an Irish immigrant. Many of the laborers who built it were slaves. And on his second day living here, John Adams wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail, praying that only honest and wise leaders would rule under this roof. Beneath that roof resides not just a seat of government, of course, but also a living museum, a home to history, and a working office building. Let's go inside and have a look around. Just inside the north entrance of the White House, this is the Cross Hall. Thousands of tourists walk here every week, taking selfies with portraits of presidents past in the same hall where Jefferson displayed antlers and pelts from Lewis and Clark's expedition. We've welcomed many heads of state here, and this is the carpet that I walk down toward the East Room over there on the left to tell the world that we had delivered justice to Osama bin Laden. I'll never forget coming in here for the first time after my inauguration starting a new job and moving our family into a new home on the same day. You couldn't help but feel a sense of wonder and gratitude about this place, and that never goes away. The White House is the people's house, and Michelle and I always joke, uh, we're just renters here, and uh, the owners are uh, the American people and all those who've invested in uh, creating this uh, amazing place with so much history. And what we wanted to do was to make sure that everybody felt they had access to it, that uh, it, it wasn't just the well-connected or somebody who knew a member of Congress that they could see this, that uh, as many people as possible could come in and appreciate uh, the place where a Lincoln or an FDR or uh, a Reagan uh, had made decisions that had helped uh, to shape America. And there are a lot of artifacts here that help uh, you appreciate, you know, in a, in a vivid and uh, visceral way, uh, the power of, uh, of this place. Next door to the Oval Office is the Cabinet Room, with the Rose Garden just beyond those windows. The president sits at the center of the table, opposite the vice president, and each cabinet secretary's seat is assigned according to when their department was established. Sitting in this room gives you the most diverse snapshot of the breadth of issues a president confronts on a daily basis. It's always humbling to look around this table and see people from all walks of life, experts in agriculture and healthcare and foreign policy, working as a team in common cause. This is also where I met with congressional leaders early in 2009 as we planned America's response to the deep economic crisis we inherited at the start of my presidency. It's where President Kennedy convened his national security advisors during the 13 harrowing days of the Cuban Missile Crisis and met with NASA to plan the mission to the moon. And it's where Harry Truman took the oath of office in 1945 after Franklin Roosevelt, our longest serving president, died. I've hung a portrait of Truman on the wall to the right just by the entrance. Downstairs, in the basement of the West Wing, is the Situation Room. It's actually a series of rooms with secure video conference technology that lets us communicate with generals and leaders from around the globe. Intelligence and national security officials work here 24-7. Early in his presidency, John F. Kennedy recognized that the White House needed a central information center to monitor intelligence and military missions. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, used these rooms during the Vietnam War as did George H.W. Bush during the first Gulf War and George W. Bush after 9-11. You might know the Situation Room best as the place where we planned the raid on bin Laden and then watched it unfold. I'll never forget the tension of those critical hours. Back upstairs, the Roosevelt Room is the original location of the President's office in the West Wing. When Teddy Roosevelt had the West Wing built in 1902, this is where he worked. 
Franklin Roosevelt expanded the West Wing, including moving the Oval Office to its current location. But it was in this room that he crafted the bold proposals that became the New Deal. This is the room where my staff and I watched Congress pass the Affordable Care Act, and where I've convened community leaders and business leaders and listened to their ideas about our economy, epidemics like gun violence, and great challenges like our changing climate. When you're dealing with the toughest issues of our time, it's inspiring to sit in a room named for the Roosevelts, not only because of Teddy and Franklin. Look to your left, and you'll see a bust of former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt next to the lamp. There's no question that Joe Biden will go down as the finest vice president in American history. This is his office, just down the hall. Joe has been my point man on implementing the economic recovery plan that saved our country from another depression and a trusted advisor on a range of high stakes foreign policy initiatives. A major part of his legacy will be the work we've started on the Cancer Moonshot, a project close to Joe's big heart. As you look around this room, you can see why America loves Joe Biden. He is truly a family man. His office is overflowing with pictures of his kids and grandkids. Joe and Joe Biden have meant so much to our country over their decades of service and to Michelle and me over the past eight years. They've become like family. This is the place where I've spent a lot of time over the last eight years. I remember when I first walked in and I looked around and I thought, uh, it's actually not as big as I imagined it on television. Uh, it's a fairly intimate space. What also struck me was the amazing light that comes in from these windows uh, that you don't always fully appreciate uh, when you just see photographs of it. You never stop feeling humbled by the Oval Office. You never forget that it's in this room where decisions of war and peace and major advancements in civil rights and human rights have all been made where for generations, the major debates of the day have taken place. I meet with my senior staff here every single day. I've met here with leaders of Congress and of other countries. I always believed it was more important to take the long view and not to get sidetracked by minute by minute distractions, to stay true to my values and remember why we came here. That's why when I'm sitting at the Resolute desk, I look at busts of Lincoln and Dr. King. When I look out the window, I can also see my girl's swing set. The first day coming into this house was a whirlwind because it's inauguration day. You don't get access to this house until the day that the president-elect takes the oath of office and actually becomes the president of the United States. And you feel that way for several months. Um, it takes some time to really settle in and feel like this place is your home. So it was probably around March that I started to be able to take a deep breath and feel this place as not a museum, but as my home. And once we sort of um, transcended that hurdle, um, it really does feel like home to us. Uh, there are two floors upstairs uh, above the state floors, and that's where our home is. That's where our children have grown up. Uh, our children were very little, and Sasha was only in second grade, so this is really the only home she really knows. The staff here, there are friends, there are family, there are people we will miss dearly, uh, and they've done just an excellent job making this uh, wonderful house that is the people's house feel like the home for every first family that walks through those doors, and we will miss it. We'll continue our visit on the state floor, the first level of the White House residence and the traditional space for hosting public events. This is the Red Room, an elegant parlor and sitting room that has been used for small dinners, social gatherings, and even family musical recitals during the Lincoln administration. Most recently, Eleanor Roosevelt organized briefings here for women journalists who were excluded from regular press conferences. Early on, the green room served as Thomas Jefferson's dining room. A few years later, 
James Madison came here to sign America's first declaration of war, which began the War of 1812 against Great Britain. These days, this is a quiet space where my husband and I often privately greet our guests or thank performers for coming to the White House before we head next door to the East Room for a concert or event. Over the years, the East Room has hosted countless state dinners, concerts, and other important moments in American history. Musicians like Itzhak Perlman, Dizzy Gillespie, Gloria Estefan, Stevie Wonder, and Melissa Etheridge have performed here. This is where President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act and where Barack signed the Affordable Care Act. Even the paintings are legendary. Dolly Madison saved this famous Gilbert Stuart portrait of George Washington when British troops set fire to the White House in 1814. On the ground floor, the Vermeer Room honors previous First Ladies who have lived in this home and blazed a trail for the rest of us. Jacqueline Kennedy's portrait remains in a place of honor in recognition of her timeless grace and tireless efforts to preserve the White House. Her efforts included securing artwork, restoring furniture, and making crucial repairs. Through her efforts, Mrs. Kennedy ensured that future generations of Americans can take pride in our nation's house. The state dining room might look spacious now, but try to picture it with over 200 guests and performers during an official state visit. It took a lot of careful planning to set up a state dinner here to welcome the Chinese president, President Xi, back in 2011. Fortunately, we have a great team in the White House and everyone pitched in, from the social office, to the electricians, to our fabulous chefs. As you're looking around, make sure to take in the new drapes which echo the distinctive band of Kailua Blue on our Obama China service, a color representing the waters off the coast of Hawaii where my husband was born and raised. Now we're in what is known as the old family dining room. As recently as the Kennedy administration, this is where the first families would often come to eat, which meant dressing up and coming downstairs for a proper dinner. It was a formal space that didn't really lend itself to the kind of relaxed family meals we prefer in the Obama family. This room was never a part of the official White House tour. And because we wanted to broaden the tour and show more of the White House, this was the room that was primed for renovation and remodel. This is one of the few places where we're really getting to showcase modern and abstract art. And my favorite piece in the entire room is Alma Thomas's piece, Resurrection. Um, it's a beautiful, vibrant uh, painting that, you know, represents hope and possibility, which is an important theme of this administration. But it's also important to me because Alma Thomas is the first female African-American artist to have her work be a part of the White House uh, collection. So that's an exciting part of, of the story of this room. Inclusiveness, uh, contemporary art, uh, life, vibrancy, all of which I, I think is representative of what this administration stands for. We conclude our visit on the state floor with a room at its very center, the Blue Room. This room has always been one of our favorites, especially after Barack was sworn in here for his second term in 2013. Whether welcoming military families from across America or dancing with a 106-year-old great-great-grandmother, the President and I have made some special memories in this beautiful room.
Like the blue room directly above it, you'll notice the diplomatic reception room is a big oval. This design dates back to George Washington's time, who saw oval rooms as a symbol of democracy. The president could stand in the center to greet everyone at a similar distance, and nobody gets stuck in a corner. For more than a century, presidents have used this room to welcome diplomats and heads of state, including the Queen of England. Jackie Kennedy added the wallpaper, which depicts landscapes like Virginia's Natural Bridge, Boston Harbor, and Niagara Falls. This is also where Franklin Roosevelt recorded his famous fireside chats. On a Sunday night a week after my inauguration, I used the radio to tell you about the banking crisis, about the measures we were taking to meet it. FDR understood how important it is for a president to communicate directly with the American people. Of course, every president since has used radio, television, and now the web and social media to meet citizens where they are. And what you're participating in right now is another step in the story of our progress. I took you to the Oval Office. Now let me take you to my private office up on the second floor of the residence. A reporter once called this room the presidential man cave. I don't know about that, but it is where I spend a lot of time at the end of the workday, going through briefing books and writing speeches and reading 10 of the letters that I get every day from the American people. I happen to be a night owl, and this is where I work. It's called the Treaty Room. It's on this big desk where President McKinley ended the Spanish-American War. It's also where President Kennedy signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But presidents have fun here too. Apparently, President Eisenhower liked to play bridge here, and I've watched my share of Bulls games on the big screen TV. In the residence, the place that always inspires me is the Lincoln bedroom. Part of what makes it special is that in the Lincoln bedroom, you have one of five handwritten copies of the Gettysburg Address, written by Lincoln himself uh, as part of a war charity. To be able to read the Gettysburg Address late at night, uh, if you're feeling a little frustrated with the job, uh, to see his writing, the brevity and the power of that speech. Um, to, to reflect on the burdens he carried uh, and, and the awesome responsibilities and the eloquence and grace with which he responded uh, to uh, the, the most important crisis of our nation's time on this earth. That has always been something that uh, I have appreciated and I suspect that on the last night before I leave here uh, there'll probably be some place where I spend some time. It's been the privilege of my life to serve as your president and commander-in-chief. The country's changed a lot in the eight years that we've been fortunate enough to call the White House home. And as my family moves out, by so many measures, America is a stronger, safer, better educated, and more tolerant country than we were on the day we moved in. That's not just because of what happened in these rooms. It's because of what happened in homes and schools and factories and communities and in hearts all across our great country. It's because of the resilience and resourcefulness of the American people. And that's what gives me confidence that our best days still lay ahead. Every president moves to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue with the full awareness that it is a temporary address. In our time here, we made some great progress, great friends, and great memories. That's what I'll take with me most, the same way you carry memories of your own homes. This is where we watched our daughters grow up. This is where I watched staffers who started with me in Springfield and Sioux City, Iowa, start families of their own. This is where we got to meet talented, devoted, optimistic Americans from every corner of the country and every station in life. Because as beautiful as these buildings are, it's the people in them and the work that's done here. The triumphs and tragedies you experience over the course of your years here, that's what imbues a place with meaning.